Hi, and welcome to the Burlington Northern Pacific Division in HO Scale. Today we're going to be touring Tim Dickinson's incredible BN layout. He models the Burlington Northern and specifically a line from Spokane to Seattle, Washington. And as soon as you walk into this room, you really get a feel that you're in the Pacific Northwest with heavy mountain grades, steep terrain, and just a general overall feel of the area. So I'm really excited to share with you guys. It's an incredibly detailed layout, probably one of the most detailed layouts that I've seen with working CTC signals from point A to point B and all sorts of other neat aspects of this railroad, which are really unique. So I'm excited to share with you guys. And before we go any further, I just wanna thank Tim for the opportunity to see it myself, but also to share it with you guys. I know it's incredibly inspiring for me and I think it'll be for you as well. So that being said, let's go ahead and get started. I want to share just a little bit of general information about the layout itself before we begin our detailed tour. It is a prototype freelance layout, meaning that it loosely models the prototype line between Spokane and Seattle. So even though every detail, siding, and track isn't there that's found on the prototype, you very much get the feel of the line and it's very representative with a lot of the towns, names, and structures being found in real life as well. The year, like I mentioned, is already 1976, and much of the trains, locomotives, rolling stock, and details in the layout are representative of that era. The track is code 83, it's controlled by NCE, and like I already mentioned, it's controlled by a fully automated CTC signal machine, and we'll show you a little bit more about that later on in the tour. With that being said, let's go ahead and begin our detailed tour of the layout at the west end of the railroad, which is Seattle. Welcome to Seattle Junction. This is the westernmost point of the scenic railroad on the layout. And from here, the main lines continue westbound into a tunnel. They go through a control point called Seattle Junction. You could probably see a little set of signals there and go into a staging yard, which is about 10 or 15 tracks. Their trains are staged for eastbound runs and just general operating on the layout. In the foreground is the one portion of the layout, which is unfinished, although work's being made to complete it. It has a team track, a vegetable oil transloading facility, and a scrapyard, so that'll be coming soon. And you'll also notice that all of the switches on the layout are custom built and hand laid, uh, and they use the Details West detailing kit, so they're incredibly detailed and realistic switches. So um, I believe that's how most of the switches are on the layout. Following the main lines eastbound, we see that there is a yard lead, that's the track with the brown ballast, and that's going to head towards Elliott Yard. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Real quick in the background, there's just a little community up on the hill here. And the backdrop of this scene was actually taken from uh, pictures which were taken in Seattle. So just a neat little detail there as well. Also behind this hill is the CTC dispatchers panel. We'll take a look at that in a moment in detail, but this is where the dispatcher is able to control all the switches and signal on the layout and dispatch train movements. As we continue eastbound, the main lines duck under an intermediate signal bridge. If you're familiar with signals, you'll know that an intermediate signal is an automatic signal which is located in between dispatcher controlled signals and switches. It tells train crews whether they can proceed or if they need to prepare to stop at the next signal in case the dispatcher hasn't given them permission past it. Continuing eastbound, we see the Boyer Street Yard Office with a couple of BN Jeeps waiting to switch out the yard. There's also a caboose track there. And now we enter the next room. This is Elliott Yard, and like I said, it's really the hub and center point of the railroad. It's made of multiple classification tracks. The main line is just behind that, and farther behind the main line in the background of this scene are multiple structures and backdrop buildings, which is, is a little branch line called the Rat Hole. That's a little switching job which switches out all those industries, and that comes off of the main line. Here on the east end of the yard, the two main lines converge into a single main track, and here on eastward, it is single main track with CTC controlled passing sightings. And here's the Elliott Union Station. It's very reminiscent of stations and structures from that era with a little stub in passenger track there to the left of the station, and a nice long platform which can have and hold passenger trains that are of a prototypical length, maybe 10 or 12 cars, whatever length uh, Tim runs his passenger trains on the layout, but a nice long platform. Also on the east end of the yard is the Elliott Engine Terminal. And one neat thing about this layout is that it's not just the layout itself, the track and the structures that are super detailed, but it's also the models. Paul Fredriconi from Details West has detailed a lot of the engines here along with Tim, and all the freight cars as well are super detailed with grab irons, cut levers, hoses, and, and you name it. You know, it's probably on these cars and models and locomotives. So a nice consists of uh, Northern Pacific and BN power here. All these have been super detailed, have sound and LEDs, and most are lock sound equipped. So just a really nice roster of uh, Burlington Northern and Northern Pacific power here. 
also a caboose track in the background, and then an operating turntable, which would have been used to turn steam locomotives back in the day with a little roundhouse there. However, today the uh, turntable is still operational and is used to turn diesel locomotives if they're needed. Now in the background of this scene, the single main track enters its first siding. This is the west end of Canby siding. You can see the signals there on the main line. That is the second and third track from the back of this scene. So the main line is there with the lighter colored ballast. The siding is just to the left of that. And then the yard lead is even farther to the right of that. In the foreground of the scene is the Elliott car repair shop. And then the main line and siding duck under a bridge and come out on the other side of the layout. We'll pick that up in just a moment. And coming to the other side of the layout, we see the east end of Canby siding. The main track is on the right with siding on the left. And here at the control point, the tracks come together. One neat thing to look at here and just to notice throughout this tour are little details like the switches. Each of them are super detailed with switch motors, the signals are super detailed, and then the control boxes and also the code lines which run all along the layout and all along the track is just a neat detail, as well as the old intermediate signal bases there. All sorts of just little details if you look closely in this video. From here on eastbound to the summit, it's a 2.6% grade with a lot of tight curves, so Tim and his friends use manned helper operations to get these heavy trains over the hill. The tracks then duck into a tunnel and come out to one of my favorite scenes on the layout. Continuing his journey eastbound up the grade, the tracks go through a set of intermediate signals there to your left after coming out of the tunnel, across a small mountain road, and then over a large trussel. And this is just a really neat scene with bridge and scenery and trees that are very reminiscent of many scenes that you'd find on either Stevens Pass or Stampede Pass. And those are prototype rail lines which are found on the west coast and in the Cascade Mountains of the United States. So just a, a neat scene and some excellent modeling here. And once again, continuing eastbound, the track stuck under a bridge and go over a small access and maintenance away road to a little defect detector there. And then we enter the next siding. This is the siding of Summit, and this is actually the north siding. There's two different sidings. We'll take a look at the other one in a minute, but there's one on the north side of the main line that we see branch off here. And then there's one on the south side of the main line, which we'll take a look at in a minute. So this is the control point of West Summit. So here's the north siding branching off, and there's a small little mountain road which goes over it with operating crossing gates and a bell, which would come on when the train goes by. There's also a small little car repair shop and a country store there, just very reminiscent of a small mountain road and scene that you might find in the Cascade Mountains. Heading eastbound, we're actually on the other side of the hill when we came out of the tunnel into the valley that we just looked at. Um, this is the back side of the mount that mountain, so it's a really neat uh, scene divider that uses the same scene, but you really can't see any of the other tracks, so it gives you a nice sense of distance and is a great use of space. Continuing along the main line and the north siding of Summit, we enter the next control point. This is where there's a crossover between the north siding and the main line. And then this is also where the south siding branches off to the right. There's also the mill storage track, which branches off here. Um, that's coming off of the north siding, and that goes to a paper mill. We'll take a look at that in a moment. And then there's also the small helper track, which branches off to the station, and that's branching off of the south siding. So lots of interesting track arrangements here for operations. You can see the town of Summit here and the Summit passenger station as well. So here's just a nice overview of Summit with both sidings, the mill storage track, and then the station as well. The Summit passenger station is a flag stop for the Empire Builder. So if there's passengers that need to board, the train will stop. If there are no passengers for the train, the station master will wave on the engineer, telling him that he can continue on to his next stop. So here you can see the just really beautiful hand-painted backdrops in the background of the scene, very reminiscent of Cascade Mountains and just um, some very steep mountain scenery there. This is physically the highest point on the model railroad, but also in the prototype as well. So this is where eastbound trains would stop, the helpers would disconnect and then return westbound to Elliott Yard. And as we continue eastbound, we come to the control point of East Summit. At this point, the tracks have already started descending with the highest point of the railroad behind them. This is the control point of East Summit where the three tracks, the north and the south siding, along with the main line, converge back to single main track. From here, the train starts descending a grade towards eastern Washington and Spokane. We'll pick this up in just a moment. But before we do, I wanted to take a quick look at the lumber mill, which is in the foreground of this scene. 
this is the Weyerhaeuser lumber mill and uh, it's organized in a really neat way. I just want to take a quick look at some of the details of this scene. So in the background of the lumber mill is the wood chip loading track and in the 70s lumber mills are starting to realize that wood chips could actually be a really profitable byproduct of the lumber making process. So they started loading these wood chips into cars and then would ship them to paper plants where they can be used for the paper making process instead of just burning them. So they're they able to make a little bit of profit there. The next two tracks in front of that are for loading cut and dimensional lumber. So in the second to last track, that's for loading the lumber onto flat cars. And then there's a nice little uh, storage house here for loading box cars as well. And that'll be used for pre-cut and dimensional lumber here as well. And then just in front of that is a track which is used to unload the logs. So how this lumber mill works is that the logs will come in on either rail car or truck. They'll be stored in a little pond here and then cut into whatever dimension of lumber is needed uh, for the customer. It'll then be shipped out on rail car, and then the byproducts, the wood chips, will be used and shipped out by rail car as well. So that's just a quick overview of this scene, but I think really excellent modeling, a little bit of work to go, but um, obviously a lot of work has been made here and a lot of progress has been made. So really excited to see how this continues to come out. Picking up the main line at the control point of East Summit where we just were, we come back into this really neat valley scene, this time crossing over the main line where we previously looked before on the western slope of this grade, and it uh, kind of crosses over in the background of the scene. And here's just a nice overview of how big the scene is, and I think one thing that I, uh, that I think really makes a model railroad look good is not having too much track, and I think Tim has done a great job here where he has lots of scenery, neat scenery dividers, um, and it's not cluttered with track. I think that is one way to really add a lot of realism to your layout and to your model railroad is to think about adding more scenery and less track. It could change operations a little bit, but it definitely adds a lot of realism like you can see here. So here, as we continue east eastbound down the grade, the tracks go through a center intermediate signals and into a tunnel. We're again gonna come out on the other side of the layout and pick up the main line there. So we're at the east portal of the tunnel that we just saw the tracks enter, and at this point the trains are really exiting the mountain range into some of the foothills and then eventually into eastern Washington flats. So here the train comes out of the tunnel and goes through a set of intermediate semaphore signals. That's an older style signal which actually has a plate which raises and lowers to tell train crews to stop or proceed. It's like a color signal but with an actual mechanical arm that raises and lowers, and Tim's actually modeled that so it works here. That's really cool. The train crosses over the Moxie River and enters the small farming and agricultural community of Moxie. Again, just very representative of an Eastern Washington scene here with a large apple orchard in the foreground, and then just a lot of farming and, and um, agricultural scenes around the tracks here. In the background is a neat little industry which is switched out by a local, that's a hog farm. So it takes covered hoppers, which delivers the feed for the hogs as they're uh, grown and raised there. And then it also has some cattle cars and hog cars, which are uh, loaded and then shipped out to slaughterhouses wherever those might be um, across the country. So neat little uh, really unique industry here which I actually haven't seen modeled before but um, just a nice job really captures the feel of eastern Washington and kind of headed into the plains a little bit once you've come out of the Cascade Mountains. The tracks cross over a road again with crossing signals and an operating bell when the train comes by over a small river and then we head into the siding of Fruitvale. This is the control point of West Fruitvale. So we have the siding branching off to the background and then the main line is in the foreground. And the neat thing here is that there's actually a little diner and Tim was telling me kind of in real life, a lot of times train crews would come up and you know, a westbound train would have to sit at the signal waiting for an eastbound train to descend the grade. And while they're doing that, they would stop out and grab a little snack or coffee or some dinner at the little diner there. So kind of just a fun little thing to model here that I think is just a neat little touch of realism and something that real train crews would probably do um, as they're operating their trains over the railroad. As we head into the town of Fruitvale, we see that it's actually a really big hub for the railroad on Tim's layout. So a lot going on here, a lot of things to look at and some neat scenery and also some neat industries and track arrangements to take a look at. So we'll take a few minutes to just uh, go into detail on the town of Fruitvale. So first off is a huge grain facility, huge grain silo where grain cars are loaded with a lot of the uh, products coming in from the region. They're then going to be loaded into uh, covered hoppers and shipped out and distributed across the system and even across the country if it's farther than the BN system itself. There's also a small yard in Fruitvale. This uh, particular town has so much industry that it actually has a yard where cars going to the different customers of the railroad are sorted and distributed. Um, so a neat little a yard here on the eastern end of the layout as well. And then there's also 
uh, something that I think is really cool is a customer that takes loaded lumber cars or, or flat cars or box cars. So if you recall earlier at Summit, there was the lumber mill and that was an origin for a lot of the lumber cars and box cars on the layout. And there's also a destination here. So I think it's cool for operations when you have an origin and a destination on the same layout uh, for particular loads. It's just a neat little touch of realism. In the background of the scene there, you probably saw Main Street, which is almost complete. That's the kind of last little uh, finishing touches that need to be made on this scene, but really cool behind the tracks there. And then some more industry as well. Fruitvale also has an industry, I believe it's a power plant, which takes some loaded coal cars. You can see those there um, in the storage yard. And then in the background of this scene, a couple more industries with a set of switchers, again, some BN Jeeps, and then a station here in the foreground as well. Another thing to note is the a long station platform, which can hold the uh, passenger trains, which are a prototypical length. I believe that would be the Empire Builder coming through here. In the background of the scene are a couple of fruit packaging and fruit distribution uh, facilities and industries. So as I mentioned, this is a big agricultural part of the railroad and kind of like you'd find in Eastern Washington, it's a big product that the state ships out. So there is a packaging plant there in the background and then the foreground as well is a little BN yard office, which is used for maintenance away crews and maintaining the railroad and the yard here. There's also the fruit bale station, which is really neatly modeled here, a lot going on. It's a busy scene and at night it lights up too. So you can see just the, the street lights and the the lights over the platform. So it's just a neat scene that Tim and his friends have really done an excellent job of modeling just an Eastern Washington town and yard um, and the associated industry here. And, and as I mentioned before, when you take a look, you could even pause the video, you can see all the different details that go into this scene, like the details of the fences, of the junkyard, and some of the scrap material laying around the maintenance away facility. And then even inside of the station itself is fully detailed and lit. And um, layouts like this are some of my favorites where you get a good overview and sense of how it looks. And then you start to look closer and you see the details just keep popping out and keep coming up. So a uh, really excellent job here as we continue eastbound, the uh, tracks kind of converge and the main line and the siding come together at the control point of East Fruitvale. Here's an operating crossing gate, which again operates when the train uh, comes by and then uh, the tracks kind of converge into a single main track and continue towards staging, uh, which is representative of Spokane. So that wraps up our tour of the scenic mainline portions of the layout. Again, there's staging past that. But now I want to take a few minutes and just talk a little bit about the CTC and signals on the layout. And I'm actually going to make a separate video entirely for how uh, Tim has modeled this and how the signals work. I think it's going to be really interesting to explain a little bit more about model railroad and even prototype signals. Um, in the coming videos. But for now, let's just take a quick look at how Tim has modeled um, the CTC machine and the signals on his layout. Welcome to the dispatcher's office for the uh, Burlington Northern Pacific Division here. And as you can see, Tim and his friends have really done an excellent job of modeling and recreating a USNS style uh, CTC machine. This is something that's very common and you'd probably find in the 70s and 80s and even maybe, maybe up to the 90s. Um, and this is pretty much how dispatchers would coordinate train movements before the days of the point and click computer screens. That's kind of what I have on my layout and a lot of the modern railroads use today. However, back in the old days, they'd use these style machines to control switches, uh, to line signals and routes, and to really coordinate train crew uh, movements over the railroad. So how this works is in the section above, which is black, it has the uh, schematic in white. And each little section of a track, which is known as a block, has a light which illuminates whenever a train is occupying that section. That way the dispatcher knows where every train is on the railroad and whether or not um, he should line a meet or coordinate train movement. So it just helps him keep track of where the trains are. Below that, in the green section of this panel, are different signal and switch levers. These switches are always on the line above and the signals are on the line below. And you can line the switch from normal to reverse or vice versa or you can also line the signal from left to right, or in this case on the railroad, east to west. So I'll explain more about how this works, but I just wanna show you a quick overview um, of how Tim has set up this uh, layout and set up this dispatcher's panel. Another neat thing is that if you don't wanna run with a dispatcher, they've also programmed this panel to be able to run automatically in a quote unquote ABS or automatic mode. So that way the signals will always just give an indication for how the switches are aligned and where the trains are. Um, and, you can, and you can throw the switches manually on the layout itself. So that's just how uh, Tim has set up his machine. Like I said, we'll have a separate video explaining a lot more of how railroad signals work coming up soon. Well, thanks for joining me on today's tour of Tim Dickinson's Burlington Northern Pacific Division layout. It's been a privilege to share it with you guys and just wanted to thank Tim again 
in closing for letting me share it. So if you have any questions, please let me know in the section below. And if not, I look forward to sharing a few more videos of this layout uh, coming up soon. And until then, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.